So we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, Carrie Ressler asked that we draw your attention of your staff um, who's involved in human subjects research studies that's active now or will be. Um, by June 24th, you actually need to do, you're welcome and invited to do EPIC training. So um, if you have any questions about that, you may already know about that, but if you have any questions, you can contact Don Sugarman for more details. It is a true pleasure to introduce Dr. Esther Deschamps. All of those of you who work closely with Esther know she is an incredibly humble person, and unlike many of us, she is devoid of narcissistic traits, and you can work with her for a long time without knowing about her many accomplishments and her deep expertise. So I'm gonna take one minute uh, to fill you in on a few things. She began her study of medicine at um, Harvard Medical School and then went on to do her adult psychiatry training at Cambridge Hospital and then came to Mass General and McLean for her child and adolescent training. She was appointed as the medical director of the Klarman Eating Disorders Program, and as that program has sort of come into fruition over the years, she's really helped to shape and grow the model into a world-class treatment center for women and girls. Esther has a unique ability to work with very medically compromised people, many of whom are often terrified about accepting help, and she's able to forge very deep and meaningful connections. I think one of the ways she does this is that she has a true compassion and deep respect for the women and girls and families under her care. She's been a leader within the Division of Women's Mental Health. We know that many of the women and girls who come into our hospital programs for PTSD and anxiety and mood disorders and substance use disorders and personality um, disorders often have comorbid eating disorders, sometimes quite severe. And Esther has been instrumental in helping us develop best practices for treating these women and girls throughout the division. So apropos of that, her talk today is entitled The Treatment of Eating Disorders on Non-Eating Disorder Units. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Esther Deschamps. So I think I figured out if I stand over here, I block the fewest people from seeing the screen. Is that correct? Sorry. Um, so as Amy said, um, I'm going to talk about the care and treatment of anorexia nervosa and bulimia nervosa. About a year ago, I spoke at the annual conference, and Chris Palmer called me, our director of medical education, to ask me to give an eating disorder talk for Grand Rounds. I graciously accepted, but I also wondered with Chris whether it wouldn't be more helpful to focus the talk on helping clinicians on other units with the treatment of eating disorders. Because I often get curbside consultations, phone calls, how do, what do we do with this patient? Or sometimes Klarman patients are admitted to the other units of the hospital. And there's um, sometimes, uh, I think it could be helpful for the staff there to know more what to do with our patients, um, other than transfer them back to Klarman, which we're very happy to have happen, and usually does happen. But how can you, when you're not on our unit, when you're on a PTSD unit or a substance use unit, or a BPD unit, how can you treat these patients? This says tips for the inpatient unit, but it's also tips for residential units, partial hospital, and even the outpatient clinic. And what I'll start to do is talk about describing the illnesses of anorexia and bulimia, how do you assess patients with anorexia and bulimia? What are the evidence-based treatments for anorexia and bulimia? And if there's time, and end with prognosis and a couple of clinical vignettes. So what is anorexia nervosa? It was first described in the medical literature in the 1600s. Sir William Gall in the 1800s coined the term anorexia nervosa. And this is from the Lancet Medical Journal, 1937, showing a prepubescent girl before and after refeeding. Jumping to 2017, what is our current understanding of anorexia nervosa? This is the Diagnostic Statistics Manual, our psychiatry Bible that is, describes all our psychiatric illnesses. And it's a busy slide, but I've highlighted the really important um, the really important characteristics. Markedly low body weight. Fears. 
behaviors, body image disturbance. This is the DSM definition of anorexia nervosa. What's my definition of anorexia nervosa? My de definition of anorexia nervosa is that it's an illness with prominent psychological symptoms which lead to behaviors, which results in the physical condition of malnutrition, which worsens the psychological symptoms, which worsens the behaviors, which worsens the malnutrition, and it is an illness that has a vicious cycle. Sometimes I use the analogy of a cobweb, where patients who start to diet get caught in a cobweb of weight loss. The majority of diets do not result in anorexia nervosa, but the majority of cases of anorexia nervosa start in the context of a diet. I also use slippery slope, I also use quicksand, but patients are really caught in this illness. And what are the psychological symptoms? These are but a few, but I'm gonna highlight two that are most important. One is fear, fear of weight gain, fear of eating, fear of food, fear of what can food or eating do to one's body a tremendous anxiety that does not get better with benzodiazepines or serotonin reuptake inhibitors, and not much with antipsychotic medications. We wish they helped, but patients live with incredible fear and incredible anxiety, and some of it is based on body image distortion. And this is so important, it deserves its own slide. This is a... Um, this is taken from a city in Europe that has a set of statues showing a patient who is very low weight looking at her reflection, which is not low weight, which is obese. And this is indeed the visual perception distortion that patients with anorexia nervosa have. They also have tactile distortion, they have distortion in proprioception, they have distortion in how they perceive body signals. They also have dissatisfaction. So they care so much about how their body is and feel very negatively about this. So in the words of a patient, this is a direct quote from a patient, I feel like my body's not me. I feel like I'm wearing a fat suit, I'm a beached whale. I have a picture of a beluga whale on my phone because that's what I feel like. And that's what our patients walk around with. So because of these psychological symptoms, they have behaviors. What are the behaviors? Number one, restricting. Anyone who's ever been on a diet knows how hard it is to cut down your food intake for any period of time. Cutting down 250 calories a day, cutting down 500 calories a day, people say it's very hard to diet in a long-standing basis. But our patients, say you have a young woman who should be eating somewhere between 2,000 and 2,500 calories, they might start by cutting down to 1,800 calories, then they cut down to 1,500 calories, then they cut down to 1,200 calories, and then they're eating 800 calories a day in an ongoing basis, and it persists as their weight goes down. Fasting is going for more than eight hours a day without eating. Restri exercising deserves a special note because it's addictive. And this isn't the, I go to the gym for half an hour and work out. This is the many hours a day and I can't stop. And I exercise when I have shin splints. So I have to go to ortho who has to boot me because I won't stop exercising because I can't because I'm trapped in having to do that. Um, very worth noting, binging and vomiting. The majority of patients with anorexia nervosa start out with restricting and exercise, and the majority of patients with anorexia nervosa have some type of binge purge behaviors. The reason why it's clinically important is a patient with anorexia who binges just freaked out. <laughs> Because if a binge has 3,000 calories, they know what that can do to their weight, and they get very afraid of, about it. Also purging, usually by vomiting, which can be very medically dangerous, because if you are a low weight patient that is not eating and not taking in potassium, any form of purging by vomiting, or even worse, by laxatives, can drop your potassium and put you in sudden cardiac risk. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. 
We also have patients taking diet pills, appetite suppressants, which includes caffeine, everybody's favorite, uh, everybody's favorite, um, avoiding risk groups, entire food groups, calorie counting, dot, 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 et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The list goes on. And then you end up with the physical condition of malnutrition, which is a condition that affects multiple organ systems. The most important three organ systems are the heart, the brain, and the bones. What happens with the heart? Where's Arthur Siegel? Dr. Siegel, what's this rhythm? <laughs> yeah. VF, VFib, thank you very much. The definition of a double-blind study is two psychiatrists reading an EKG. So I, <laughs> so I always rely on my folks in internal medicine over there. <laughs> sudden cardiac death. This is sudden cardiac death in an otherwise healthy young woman who drops her potassium and poof, it's gone. Not many people get out of VFib. Also low heart rate, low blood pressure, and the less common um, but sometimes present congestive heart failure, which is a complication of refeeding, mitral valve prolapse for prolonged anorexia. Um, the other very important thing, which is not life-threatening, at least until you're older, but very concerning, is the impact of anorexia nervosa on the bones. This is an electron micrograph of trabecular bone. So this is the bone in your spine. And you notice the very nice interconnections between, you know, between this. And this is osteoporosis, where you don't have connections and you have bone loss. And the hard thing about this is this illness usually appears in the adolescent years, in young women. Peak onset is adolescence. Guess when peak bone mass deposition is? <laughs> adolescence. And so when you have a young girl who's forming her strong skeleton, who gets into a period of malnutrition, their bone deposition stops, and they are at very high risk for osteoporosis. Now this is worsened by the fact that 14-year-olds don't care. <laughs> because 14-year-olds are never gonna be 40, because that's really old, and I'm never gonna, you know, and they don't have the kind of sense of judgment about what it means to have bone loss when you're older, because they don't have that longevity. But then by the time they're 20 or 21, I've had patients in my office in tears with their bone scans because they know that their bones are in trouble and they may not be able to get much of it back. And it's really heartbreaking. How about the brain? This is a clinical lecture, not a neuroscience lecture, but I can tell you there's some very cool research going on that's showing about how neurotransmitters, neurotransmitters, dopamine, serotonergic, brain volumes, orbital prefrontal cortex, um, neural pathways, especially the limbic system, the habit system in the brain, are altered in anorexia nervosa. We also have alterations in the endocrine, which I included on the slide with brain, because what we know about the endocrine system is hormones are produced at one, by one tissue, travel through the blood, and have their effects on multiple organ systems, including the brain. And anorexia nervosa is a completely different endocrinological milieu than a patient without anorexia nervosa. Estrogen deficiency, androgen deficiency, we know that. How about this, growth hormone resistance, hypercortisolemia, cortisol is a stress hormone. So these patients are under a constant state of physiological stress. A sick euthyroid syndrome, low oxytocin, suppressed leptin, elevated ghrelin, multiple changes in the endocrine system. Other medical effects of anorexia nervosa, um, some dermatological, very important constipation, which is a frequent uh, complaint. And then again, our low potassium and low phosphorus electrolytes that are medically concerning. So what do we have here? The vicious cycle. Psychological symptoms causing behaviors, causing physical condition of malnutrition, worsening the psychological symptoms, worsening the behaviors, and the patient is very much trapped. And so when I want to give tips to the, to the clinicians on our other units, I want to say have empathy. 
this is a tough one. And the patients um, are stuck. And they may lie and they may manipulate about how much they're eating or what their weight is or what they're doing behaviorally. They have body distortion. They might say, I don't care. I don't care about giving up this illness. But that's because they're stuck. And it's a hard to treat illness, but it is a treatable illness. How do we assess a patient? First thing you want to do is make a diagnosis. Now people will say, but that's easy. These patients look like they're, they have an eating disorder, but many patients with anorexia hide it. They come in in baggy clothes. They don't wear shorts even in the summertime. They pretty much deny. They say, I've always been low weight. They don't come out and say, I have this illness. So you have to ask them. They often don't ask, don't tell. So we want to look for clues and ask questions. Some of the clues you might see, dieting. But again, this is not the usual diet. This is an extremely restrictive diet. A diet that starts out with cutting this food out, cutting that food out. Eventually, I had a patient who was eating lettuce and strawberries. And I had another patient who had a list of 30 foods she could eat, and they were all green. So it's a very restrictive diet. Excessive exercise, rapid, severe weight loss, a focus on body image and appearance, and in an otherwise, and again, usually women, 90% of the illness in women, kind of unexplained why does this otherwise healthy young women have dizziness, why are they passing out, why are they complaining of the symptoms. I had a patient say, doctor, I have chronic fatigue sy syndrome. This is the symptoms of chronic fatigue syndrome. And I said, no, you have anorexia nervosa. And it'll all get better when you recover from that illness. Scoff. Scoff is a screening tool that every person who evaluates a patient in this hospital should use to try to pick up on cases of eating disorders. It is super fast, super easy, and if you have two or more positive responses to these questions, there is a very high likelihood that you have a clinically significant eating disorder. Let me go through it. S, do you make yourself sick because you feel uncomfortably full? You're asking the patient if they purge. Do you worry you've lost control over how much you eat? You're asking them if they had a, a component of binging. Have you lost more than one stone, 14 pounds, in a three-month period? That's a pound a week. That's a hard amount of weight to lose. Do you feel yourself to be fat when others think you're too thin? And would you say food dominates your life? So if you have two responses to this, then, to make it even more complicated, I'm going to recommend you do an EDEQ. So an eating disorders examination questionnaire, and again, I apologize for the busyness of this slide, but this is such a helpful screening tool. Essentially what you do is you sit down with the patient and you say, in the last 28 days or the last month, on how many of those days did you restrict? Did you fast? Did you avoid eating certain foods? On how many days did you feel fat? On how many days did you desire to lose weight? It also asks about binging, vomiting, laxatives, exercise. And in about 10 or 15 minutes, you can get a very good picture of the last 28 days of a patient's eating disorder. And you can use it to monitor progress over time. On our unit, it's on a computer system, and our patients administer it on admission, and then all along in their treatment. And we can actually see their scores and see how their treatment is progressing. Um, but very useful. How thin is thin? I'm shifting now to a medical assessment, to a weight assessment. The majority of patients who die from anorexia nervosa die when they're in this extreme BMI of less than 15. So they die from cardiac and mainly serious infections, but they're usually very, very, very low weight. Or they die from suicide, in which case they can be any weight. But these are the medically concerning. But we define severe anorexia as a BMI less than 16, moderate less than 17, mild less than 18. And in the eating disorder world, we say that normal is 20 to 25. Patients will say, no, I looked it up on the internet, it's 18.5, that's normal. <laughs> but Kathleen, my dietitian, and I hold firm, it's 20, a BMI of 20, 
or above, or sometimes closer to 25, depending on a patient's frame, muscularity, and activity level. So it's an individually set uh, weight range. And I take a weight history of all patients. What's their present weight? What's the high weight? What's the low weight? And what's their desired weight? So let me walk through. Here's an example. A 23-year-old woman's 5'6". She presents with a BMI of 16. So let's click back. 16.8. She's got moderate anorexia nervosa. But let's keep going. She has a history of a high weight of 115. Her BMI got to 18.6, which means she's always been at a very low weight. And she has a low weight of 80. She's got to a BMI of 12.9. That's death's door. And she would like to be 99 pounds, below three digits, 99 pounds, a BMI of 16. There's a calculator.net where you can quickly um, calculate BMI. So I do in my medical assessment the weight history, I check vitals, I check an EKG. On most units in the hospital, you do a complete metabolic, a comprehensive, a complete blood count, thyroid panel, drug screen. I add magnesium, phosphorus, and amylase. Amylase is an enzyme that's produced by the pancreas. In the case of acute pancreatitis, that's a very medically significant medical illness, so it's not very common. The second way that amylase is produced is from um, irritation of the parotid glands as vomit leaves the oral cavity. And so if you see an elevated amylase, there's reason to suspect that a patient is purging. And I also do the screen for the medical complications I mentioned earlier of malnutrition or purging. Also in assessing patients with anorexia, you need to assess their comorbidity. They will be on another unit because they have an, an illness other than anorexia nervosa, but one of the important things we do at the Klarman Center is to say not just what, what, not just what is going on with the eating disorder, but what more is there. The majority of patients have um, some form of an Axis I disorder, including major depression, 25%-ish have OCD, social phobia, generalized anxiety disorder, trauma, substance use disorder. Those are the important comorbidities. And if you don't treat everything, usually the eating disorder doesn't get better if you don't treat the comorbidity. And likewise, the comorbidity does not get better if you don't treat the anorexia. I went to see a patient on another unit who was profoundly depressed, but one of the things she was most depressed about is she was binging. And she was terrified because her weight was going up and she felt so awful about her body, she felt like she had to kill herself. And so yes, she had comorbid major depression, but the anorexia nervosa was complicating this. So what are my tips? First of all, actively screen for the illness. If you look for it, you will find it. Most patients will, if you ask the right questions, actually be pretty upfront about what's going on. Add a weight history to the physical workup. Add magnesium, phosphorus, and amylase to your admission labs, and know that anorexia nervosa complicates comorbidity. A malnourished brain will not get better no matter what medications you give to a malnourished brain. And so patients have to recover from their anorexia as well. So how do we treat this vicious cycle? First of all, I want to give a caveat about different forms of therapies for anorexia nervosa. What I am talking about is specialist supported clinical management. What I am not going to talk about is several other modalities that specialists use to treat anorexia nervosa. That includes a form of family-based treatment, which has good efficacy for young children and adolescents with the short duration, the Maudsley, the cognitive behavioral therapy from Christopher Fairburn in England. There's focal psychodynamic. There's cognitive remedial. There's a lot of other therapies that I'm not going to address. I'm going to give you the specialist-supported clinical management for anorexia nervosa. And in starting to talk about treatment, the first thing I do is triage for the danger zone. Which patients are at risk of death? 
There is an elevated suicide risk in patients with eating disorders, especially anorexia nervosa. Any suicidality in these patients must be taken seriously. Sometimes the suicidality is a little bit of, I don't care if I keep losing weight and my eating disorder kills me, and other times it's actually more active suicidality. But it needs to be considered and taken very, very seriously. Also cardiac and electrolytes that I've spoken about earlier. So again, what's the danger zone? I started by saying this is a psychological illness that causes behaviors, that causes weight loss. But in many ways, the treatment of it is to first physically restore and stop the behaviors while you're trying to help with the psychological uh, symptoms. And, and what do we do with physical recovery? We want patients to eat and gain weight. How much weight? We want patients to get up to a full, healthy, completely recovered weight range where their brain and body are no longer malnourished. The great news is, if you reverse the effects of malnutrition, other than osteopenia or osteoporosis, for the most part, the body recovers. <laughs> and the brain normalizes and the heart normalizes and everything gets medically better if you get someone up into physical recovery. We have to do safe refeeding, which means starting with the low meal plan and slowly increasing it, watching for some medical complications along the way. And how much weight outpatient is 0.5 pounds, inpatient or residential R unit, four pounds a week. <laughs> And you're going to ask, isn't that a lot of food? <laughs> and I'm going to say, that's a lot of food. <laughs> One of my patients said, I'm eating more than my mom and dad combined. And I said, yes, you are. <laughs> so can you imagine a patient who is admitted eating 800 calories a day, and pretty soon they're on these, as the patients say, ginormous meal plans. <laughs> but that's what they have to do to recover. And believe it or not, the majority of our patients do the right thing and get fully recovered to a fully weight recovered weight range. We also want to treat their behaviors. So regular eating is a term that comes from Christopher Fairburn's CBT program. Regular eating is breakfast, lunch, snack, dinner, snack. <laughs> eating about five times a day, letting no more than four hours go between eating, and making sure you eat. Think about the treatment of alcoholism versus anorexia nervosa. In alcoholism, your job is to not drink. Your job is to avoid alcohol. Your job is to make sure when you take that cough syrup that you want to do for at night that it doesn't have alcohol. You have to stay away from alcohol. With anorexia nervosa, you have to do the opposite. You have to bring yourself to the table five times a day for the rest of your life and eat. And so in many ways, it's a much higher burden. I don't want to say the treatment of alcoholism. I don't want to imply the treatment of alcoholism is easy, Andy. But it's a different sort of thing that you're, that you're up against. We want to make sure patients eat adequate calories. Here's the problem. Even a weight-recovered patient with anorexia nervosa will tend to undereat. They'll tend to overestimate the amount of food they're eating. They'll tend to err on the side of safety because they don't want to continue to gain weight, and they will tend to undereat. We want to make sure they can eat in a variety of settings. More food variety is better prognosis. <laughs> One of my patients said, what's the nutritional value of Oreos? And I said, not much. <laughs> On the other hand, the psychological value of being able to eat Oreos and being able to eat desserts and being able to eat ice cream and french fries and other foods is huge because that means you've broken away from your fear of food and eating. And no brownie can make you gain 10 pounds. And until a patient eats brownies and realizes I didn't gain 10 pounds, they won't loosen up their fear. Food variety, no purging. 60%-ish of patients who start out with, with anorexia morph into a bulimic picture. And here's how it happens. They start eating, and they purge so that they can take care of their eating. And then they start binging, and then they 
developed in case of bulimia nervosa. So making sure that the patient doesn't symptom shift into purging and watching normal exercise to make sure that exercise doesn't get compulsive and that the patient isn't holding a reasonable weight but with a lot of compulsive exercise that's really keeping them trapped in this illness. I found a sad emoji <laughs> on the internet. <laughs> and so here's the sad news. Unfortunately, at least in the short term, the psychological symptoms, remember the body distortion? Remember that fear, that anxiety? Unfortunately, it usually persists, at least in the short term when patients are fully weight recovered. So they're walking around doing the right thing with respect to food and eating, even though they often feel awful about themselves. And this is the chronic burden of patients who have anorexia nervosa, is they often continue with body image distortion, fears and anxieties, even when they're physically recovered. I want to say a word about psychopharmacology. Um, Little evidence for medication. A lot of medications have been tested. Not great extensive tests, but lots of different things. Tricyclic antidepressants, serotonin reuptake inhibitors, lithium, you know, periactin, zinc, et cetera, et cetera. Bottom line is there's very little evidence that medications help with the core symptoms of anorexia nervosa. If you were to say which medication is the most helpful for weight gain, probably it would be olanzapine. On the other hand, Olanzapine is an antipsychotic that's associated, especially in patients with bipolar and psychotic disorders, with really significant weight gain. If you actually go to a patient with anorexia nervosa and say, would you take this medication that's associated with clinically significant weight gain, the majority of them are too afraid to take it. And so there's limited efficacy for, for these medications. We often treat our comorbid conditions, often once our weight normalized. And this is my take home message with respect to medications. Doctor, do no harm. Remember the Hippocratic Oath? Doctor, do no harm. Medications have side effects. And the side effects hit our patients who are malnourished really hard. Deseril. Sleep medication, commonly used in this hospital. Quiteopine, sleep medication and anti-anxiety and antipsychotic, commonly used in this hospital. Prazosin, PTSD medication, commonly used in this hospital. Drop blood pressure badly, and patients end up very hypotensive. So you have to be careful for anything that has prolonged cardiac conduction, low blood pressure, appetite suppressants, nausea, weight loss, or weight gain. If you give a patient a medication and they gain weight, they freak out. And then they stop eating and then they relapse. So you have to be very careful with your medications. So what are my tips? Do a careful suicide assessment. Do a cardiac assessment. Watch your medication side effects. Know that the eating disorder will impact mood and anxiety. It will worsen mood. It will worsen anxiety. And start a treatment plan which mimics outpatient treatment. So this is prescriptive. And I'm sorry. <laughs> but it's very like, do this, 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 this. You don't have to do it, but it is, this is what I would do if I had a patient on an inpatient unit. First of all, I diagnose them with anorexia nervosa. And I say, we should start treatment for your anorexia nervosa. The first thing we should do is start you on an 1,800 calorie meal plan. Now you're going to say, what's an 1,800 calorie meal plan? You don't have to worry about that. Your patient with anorexia nervosa will know what an 1,800 calorie meal plan is because they know the caloric content of most foods. I used to think bagels and toast had the same caloric content. One of my patients said, no, bagels have so many more calories than toast. <laughs> they know. Kathleen knows too, but they also know. So start in an 1800 and say, try to eat an 1800 calorie meal plan. If you can't eat solid food, which is better for your gastrointestinal tract, then take Ensure, take Boost, take Carnation Instant Breakfast, take chocolate milkshakes, I don't care. Just take some kind of something to get yourself nutritionally restoring. I would say to them, and stay out of the bathroom after meals if you're worried that you're going to purge. Just sit in front of the nursing station. Just make sure you don't go to the bathroom for about an hour after. This has got to be voluntary. At Clarman, it's not voluntary, but in other units, it can be voluntary. 
I would give them FOSNAC or Nutrafos twice a day for a week. That's a medical thing because you can drop your uh, uh, phosphorus levels. I would check their phosphorus, magnesium, amylase, and BMP twice a week for the first week. Arthur, you can tell me if you disagree, if you think it should be more. Um, jump in. And I would weigh them twice a week in the morning, prior to eating, prior to having coffee. We call it a dry weight to see how they're doing. And I'd make sure I knew what their BMI was, and I'd tell them, you know, you obviously need to gain weight. If all goes well, the next week, you tell them, eat more. <laughs> Because again, they have to gain weight. So you say, eat more. Eat 2,100 calories. Continue your bathroom restriction. If they're finishing meals, they can go on a couple staff walks a week. They should not go to the fitness center because they won't gain weight if they go to the fitness center. You should continue to weigh them, but they don't probably need labs or vitamins if they're doing, doing well. And then week three, 2,500 calories a week. Again, you're increasing the meal plan to have them gain weight, continuing walks, doing your weigh-ins. Do not set a weight range because we don't want to have a patient who's gone to the inpatient unit and had a doctor tell them, oh, that doctor said my weight only has to get to such and such. And then we say, well, that doctor doesn't know about eating disorders, and your weight actually has to get to such and such. So please don't set a weight range on your patients. And watch out for the exercising or the purging that's going to undo it. And after discharge, and this is perhaps the most important, please refer them to an eating disorder treatment team for ongoing treatment. If you don't know treaters, Call Clarman. We know everybody. And if we don't know everybody in the Massachusetts area, we have contacts outside of Massachusetts. And very important that these patients have an outpatient treatment team because they will not recover fully on your unit, but they can start the treatment process. And when should they go to Clarman? If their suicidality is stable and they're at a low BMI. That's not that low, but guess what? I had a patient come to me from the eating disorder, um, from, from the trauma unit, and I said, your weight was 10 pounds higher over there. And she said, oh, I just put rocks in my pocket. Nobody ever knew. So often the, the weight that you get is an underestimate of a true weight. So anyone who's not gaining weight, who's purging, binging, or compulsively exercising can actually bear a treatment, uh, can benefit greatly from a treatment at the Clarman Center. Switching now to the other end of the spectrum, what is bulimia nervosa? We've talked about anorexia. What is bulimia nervosa? This is, again, coming from the DSM. The hallmark symptom in this illness is reoccurrent binge eating. That means eating a large amount of food in a short amount of time in a way that feels out of control. One study showed that the average binge was about 3,500 calories. It can be really a significant amount of food and very upsetting to the patient. And they have compensatory behaviors to prevent weight gain. So they're binging and they're doing something. So this is my definition. <laughs> It's a psychological illness where patients are trying to lose weight, which are failing because they have breakthrough binging, which then worsens their psychological symptoms, which then causes them to worsen their behaviors to lose weight, which then causes binging, which then worsens their psychological. So they have a vicious cycle, but they have physical manifestations but a normal weight. So here is very important. Patients with bulimia don't look as if they have an eating disorder. We had a patient who had very severe bulimia get picked up by a cabbie. This is the days before Uber, people used cabs, right? And the cabbie who came to all the units on McLean knew that we were an eating disorder unit. She said, oh, you must be a staff member. You don't look like you have an eating disorder. And she had terrible bulimia, and she was mortified. Um, because in this illness, the weight is normal. So what are the psychological symptoms? Body image distortion, same thing as anorexia nervosa. Fears, anxieties. We also have preoccupations, obsessions, stress-induced binging. Stress shuts down feeding in anorexia nervosa. In bulimia nervosa, stress induces binging. So it's a little bit of an opposite. More shame, maybe better insight more motivation to give up their eating disorder. And what are their behaviors? Lo and behold, the same behaviors as anorexia nervosa, except binging is at the top of the list. 
Also important to note, not all patients with bulimia nervosa vomit. So if you have a patient with bulimia who does not vomit, they will frequently say, I have binge eating disorder, when indeed they actually have bulimia nervosa, not binge eating disorder, because they're restricting vomiting, restricting exercising, and trying to lose weight. So you do not need purging to have bulimia nervosa. That is non-purging bulimia nervosa. And then we have physical manifestations with normal weight. Here's that same cardiac rhythm. Drop your potassium, sudden cardiac arrest. <laughs> so the patients with bulimia who die from medical causes die usually from sudden cardiac arrest. We also have low heart rate and low blood pressure. Purging stimulates the vagus nerve that travels right along the trachea <laughs> and drops your heart rate. And so I see low blood pressure and low heart rate out of proportion when a patient stops, starts purging. As a matter of fact, one of the ways I know patients on our unit are purging is I just look at their heart rate and it's like they're going along fine, they're going along fine. It's like, woof, heart rate of 47. <laughs> What's going on? The patient might be purging. We also can see the electrolyte abnormalities, low potassium, elevated bicarb. You can have gastrointestinal tears from binging, gastritis, gastroesophageal reflux disease, uh, dysmotility of the, of the bowels due to laxative abuse, enamel loss and caries, and parotid and salivary gland swelling from purging. So that's the physical picture of um, bulimia. And how do we treat this vicious cycle? Tips for the inpatient unit, understand that this is an illness with profound psychological symptoms, but patients are motivated to recover but need to stop trying to lose weight. So I have patients who come in and say, Doc, I want to give up my eating disorder. And I say, all right, you want to give up binging? Yes. You want to give up purging? Yes. Do you want to give up trying to lose weight? Oh, no, no. <laughs> No, 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 I want to keep trying to lose weight, but I want to stop binging and purging. And my job is to say, you can't stop binging and purging unless you stop trying to lose weight. And if patients can get that, then the care and treatment goes much more smoothly. So let's make the diagnosis, switching to assessment. Often, don't ask, don't tell. Look for clues, ask questions. So the patients with anorexia nervosa have a weight, weight picture that looks like this. They lose weight, they come into treatment, they gain weight. They get out of treatment, their weight trickles down and they lose weight, they come into treatment, they gain weight, they lose weight. The natural history of, is a tendency for weight loss. With bulimia, you have weight cycles. So you might have a patient who starts off at 130, loses weight with anorexia to 110, gains weight to 130, starts losing again, goes up to 150, down to 110, up and down and up and down. So you have weight cycles, which are really prominent with patients with bulimia. You might notice after, the, after meals, they go to the bathroom. There might be vomit, laxatives, or enemas in the bathroom. And here's some medical signs, um, some laboratory, and some knuckle abrasion or parotid or salivary gland swelling um, that you see. And again, this is the scoff, which I mentioned with anorexia for a screening tool. And this is the EDQ, which I mentioned for anorexia. Equally helpful for bulimia nervosa. And the comorbidity for bulimia nervosa is very significant with the majority of patients having anxiety disorders, mood disorders, substance use disorders, impulse control disorders. And if I can say one thing, eating disorders are mood destabilizing and anxiety provoking. And so they kind of keep everything um, going. So what do we know for tips? Screen for this illness. Take a weight history to understand the psychological importance of the patient's current weight. If they're on their weight cycles, but they're on the top of their weight cycles, and they're all of a sudden 170, when three months ago they were 140, they may be like, Doc, I don't care what you tell me. I am not trying to stop losing weight. I am going to lose weight because they are so overwhelmed because they just gained 30 pounds. On the other hand, if they're 140, and that's where their weight usually is, they can sometimes get off that weight roller coaster and, and start stabilizing their illness. You need to check their admission labs of magnesium phosphorus amylase, and you need to know that bulimia nervosa complicates the comorbidity. So well, how do we treat this vicious cycle? 
We got a patient, they're upset about their body, they have attempts to lose weight, which causes binging. So what causes binging? This is straight from Christopher Fairburn's CBT. Binging, ox hunger, Greek word, ox hunger. <laughs> Patients starve. They get up in the morning. They don't eat breakfast. They don't eat lunch. They don't eat snack. They are starving. And they start eating. And especially if they start eating a simple carbohydrate, poof, they get into a binge. Breaking a food rule. Same thing with diets. I can't eat this. I can't eat that. And then I eat some of it. And it's like, oh, well, what the heck? And we go on and we eat the whole lot of it. Emotional upset triggers binging. And people go and get drunk, and they start eating, or they, they get high on pot, and they go ahead and, and get the munchies and start binging. So when you treat binging, treat what causes binging. So for hunger, we use regular eating. Hey, that's that same old breakfast, lunch, snack, dinner, snack. One of our dietitians used to say, food is your anti-binge medicine. And I say that to all patients. If you eat breakfast, lunch, snack, dinner, snack, and you're getting adequate calories, and we take the fuel out of the urge to binge by not making you hungry, you can usually handle your urges to binge. We want to treat all or nothing thinking with a variety of food. So getting people eating pizza which is a thing they usually binge on, so they cannot binge on it. We want to treat emotional upset with skills, so you have the urge to binge and you urge surf. And you say, I feel like binging, but I'm not going to. I'm gonna stay out of the kitchen, I'm gonna use a distress tolerance skill, I'm gonna go for a walk, and then I'll come back and, and move on. And then sobriety ensures a clear head. Right? So one of the reasons why I tell my patients with bulimia that they really need to stop drinking and stop smoking pot is because you can't make the right decision if you're high or if you're drunk. You will get the what the hecks. Everybody know the what the hecks? What the heck? What the heck? Might as well do it. And then they get back in and then they feel bad and then they say, well, what the heck? Forget recovery. So we really want to get them to be um, to sober as they get into early recovery. Behavioral change, same thing as anorexia, regular eating, adequate calories, variety of settings, variety of food, stopping purging, normal exercise. And here it is with the psychological symptoms. Not so much a sad emoji, but a prescription. You have to back burner negative body image. You have to accept my body I'm not comfortable with my body. I have distortion and dissatisfaction. That's the definition of an eating disorder. But if you have, a, if you have an eating disorder, you have to back burner that and try to go about your life finding things that make you feel better about yourself. <laughs> because if you try to change your body, you'll get back into the vicious cycle. Treatment guidelines, what we know is and what I do in my private practice, cognitive behavioral therapy, this is coming from Christopher Fairburn in Oxford. He wrote a lovely book, The Cognitive Behavioral Therapy of Eating Disorders. I use it all the time. Um, and you encourage patients and engage them and stop trying to lose weight. And there is more evidence for medications. However, the medication trial, which was fluoxetine, which was helpful to decrease binge purge frequency, there were two problems. One, it was only short term, 16 weeks, right? And also, it did not bring patients into remission. It really decreased the frequency. So helpful, but more helpful is a good CBT treatment. And again, doctor do no harm. Avoid medications that increase seizure or cardiac risk if purging type. Bupropion is contraindicated in patients with an eating disorder that purge because you can have a seizure, especially at doses above 450 milligrams, and you can increase your cardiac risk if you have low potassium. How about treatment plan on a non-eating disorder unit? This one is much shorter. First of all, no dieting. <laughs> just eat. Eat breakfast, eat lunch, eat snack, eat dinner, and just don't diet, and don't try to lose weight. You can ask patients to voluntarily restrict their access to the bathroom until their purging is under control. I ask my outpatients to do this. I say, when you eat, don't go to the bathroom if you're gonna purge. Don't take a shower if you're gonna purge. 
don't, you know, just really try to hold through that urge to purge because if you purge, you will keep the cycle of binging going. Exercise can be very helpful if the patient is eating and they don't have a history of compulsive exercise. And again, if you take a symptom picture of the eating disorder and the eating disorder remains out of control, do not expect that a patient's mood or anxiety is gonna be better. <laughs> Expect that the patient will continue to have a rocky mood and anxiety. Often when I admit patients to my unit who have bulimia, I say, let's get you eating, sleeping well, off drugs and alcohol, and then in a couple weeks, we'll get a very good sense of how much depression and anxiety we have left. And sometimes it stabilizes wonderfully. Just stopping all the behaviors around. Don't want to make, make as if it's that easy, but sometimes it's very stabilizing. And again, you can refer to an outpatient eating disorder, team after discharge, or to Klarman Center. We treat a lot of patients with bulimia nervosa and are very helpful in getting them not just to give up their eating disorder, but everything that goes around it. And the good news is the insurance companies, for the most part, pay for our patients to be treated on our unit, which is, which is uh, something about which we're very pleased. What's the prognosis? This is uh, anorexia nervosa, this is a meta-analysis, meaning Steinhausen took 119 patient series of 5,500 patients, and he said, what percentage recovered? He also said the results were so variable, this can only be taken as trends towards a mean. So this is not beautiful science. <laughs> On the other hand, what we know is that there's about a 5% mortality rate. So that makes it the most deadly illness next to substance abuse in psychiatry. And this is young women, usually young women, who wouldn't have, would not have died otherwise and that die from this illness. About half the patients recover and the other half make um, uh, a significant, I'm sorry, about half patients recover, a third make improvement, and about 20% of patients end up with a condition called severe enduring anorexia nervosa, still treatable, don't give up hope. <laughs> patients with severe enduring anorexia nervosa can definitely make good progress and recover from their illness. Bulimia, I'm sorry, bulimia has a somewhat better um, outcome with 50% recovering another 25% improving, 25% having chronic, but the mortality rate for bulimia is much lower. So I have about five minutes left, and so the question is, do you want me to go through a couple of clinical vignettes, or do you want to do questions? Yes, please. In. So the question is, has anyone looked at gut bacteria and how it might affect? So the last um, International Eating Disorder Conference, which was actually he held here in Boston, the keynote speaker, who's a researcher by the name of Cindy Bulick, talked about the intestinal microbiome. <laughs> and it's a fascinating thing. Um, what we know, and Patricia, you were there. What did Cindy Bulick say? When you're really low weight, the gut microbiome is very inefficient at garnering calories and it improves as you get better. Was that the take home message? They did this cool thing where they took mice and they implanted um, bacteria from anorexia patients compared to controls and found that with the acute anorexic patient, the gut microbiome is actually an inefficient one. Is it, was that it? Do you remember? Yes, yes. But it's an area of great interest and great research. I was wondering, uh, I work on the trauma unit, and, I, and we have a lot of patients there with eating disorders, and they often are requesting laxatives, yes. but they also, oh, yes. they do Go have ahead. constipation. So I was wondering, yes, oh, I love that question. how do you <gasps> yes. yeah, recommend laxative? So um, before I was getting this talk together, I sent Marge, who's so lovely, about four versions of my talk. <laughs> and I almost sent one last version, which had a slide on laxatives. <laughs> and the reason for it is laxatives are so important. There's two reasons why patients lose, use laxatives. One is to have the number go down. 
So one is for eating disorder reasons. So I see the number go down. I know it's not real because it's mainly water weight that you're using with laxatives. But I also know that all that weight is out of my body and that the number is going down and maybe I'm less bloated and I feel more comfortable. So that's one reason why people use laxatives. Unfortunately, the other reason why people use laxatives is because of trauma histories, <laughs> to get rid of myself to clean myself out. It's a self-injurious behavior. I might kill myself and I really don't care. And they really may almost kill themselves. <laughs> it's super, super dangerous. So what I say to them is Miralax, 17 grams, twice a day, that's it. <laughs> that's it, that's it. And if you're really, really constipated, I might ask someone from internal medicine to see you to see if you actually do have evidence of stool retention. You can actually get an x-ray to see whether or not someone has retained stool and needs a half bottle of mag citrate once to clean it out. <laughs> But you got to be really careful because you do have patients constantly wanting laxatives for a trauma reason. And I talk to them straight up about it. Like, yeah. Yeah. I have a couple of different questions. Thank you for this talk. Um, can you remind us? why you don't want to set a weight range for clients. Yes. And then also, I'm looking at this more from an outpatient, actually a school setting. Um, when you have a client who doesn't care if they die from their anorexia and they are very dangerous and constantly having a lot of medical issues, yes. how do you help them get help, especially when there is the complication of depression? Right. How old is the patient? We started at 17, she's now 18, which makes it more complicated. <laughs> so for a patient, so, 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 question is the weight range and then how do you help a very sick patient if they're under 18 you say to their parents this patient must be in the hospital and they must gain weight till they're in a, a healthy weight range and if they lose weight you have to rehospitalize them and you have to get them to get into and stay in a healthy weight range if they're over 18 then you have to get the parents to get a medical guardianship to refuse to let them go to college, to refuse to pay their tuition, to say, you have to come into the hospital. And if you don't, the doctor says they have a name of a lawyer that will take away your legal rights and you will be hospitalized against your will. Because when a patient is in the throes of this illness, they do not think they're in danger and they don't care that they're in danger. They're not thinking straight. Someone else has to intervene and bring them into, into the hospital. But it's a very challenging. And why not set a healthy weight range? Because unless you look at someone's growth charts and put their weight in the context of a growth chart from the time that they're a child and you look at their build and you look at their level of muscularity it's very hard to set a clinically healthy weight range and if you set a weight range or you say to a patient well you should probably be okay if you have a BMI of 19 they will hang on to that and say this doctor told me I should only have to be that and why is that doctor's opinion less important than your opinion <laughs> and it just complicates instead of saying we know you have to gain weight let's get your eating disorder team to set a clinically healthy weight range after you get but we know you need to gain weight so it doesn't matter what that number is just get going on the weight restoration piece so there's another question all right I think it's one o'clock thanks so much